Welcome to Stories and Songs, a series of interviews with musicians from the world of jazz and improvisation. I'm Andrea Keller and it's my great pleasure today to be talking with Zanny Kolak. Welcome Zanny. Hello, thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. Uh, now what have been the pivotal events in your musical journey? So I think that I can kind of bring them into three kind of things. So the first one has been moments of recognition from the industry or from my peers, um, or I like the moment that I was accepted into the VCA. That was probably one of my biggest um, moments of recognition, something that I had been really hoping for since I had been in year nine and something I really wanted to do. So when I got into there, um, it made me feel very good, but it also was the beginning of yeah, a really important journey for me. Um, and then the second thing would be certain collaborations that I've had. So um, my career has kind of been a bit of a scenic route. I've ended up over here and then over here and couldn't really have planned it. Um, opportunities would just pop up. So one of the first collaborations was when I was playing with a group called Martin Martini and the Bone Palace Orchestra. And it was kind of my first foray into touring. And I was 18 years old at the time and just starting at uni and um, would go around all of Australia playing and Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And then it kind of led me into other things like my collaboration with Tim Rogers, who was a rock musician, but I met him first in a production at Malthouse Theatre. So my first little go at playing music in a theatre production. Um, and then from there, um, I met some other peers while at uni and one of them was Manny Kachias and he's a drummer. And we started a duo called The Twox and that was kind of my first band really. Um, and we explored lots of different things just because we were friends. So I think that was kind of the second pivotal thing with those collaborations. And then the third thing is when... Um, I managed to kind of find my own voice and it took me a very long time, but when I did find it, um, it was really pivotal moment. Fabulous. And what obstacles have you had to overcome in your musical journey and how have you dealt with them? So I guess um, when I first started having obstacles was in the very beginning when I started learning violin and I was learning classical music. And um, the, I found the classical, I love playing classical music, but I found that world very competitive and very challenging. And as a violinist, it's even more so because everyone wants to be the first violinist. And um, when I was performing in orchestras uh, and, on, and chamber ensembles, they, the conductors and the um, organisers of these ensembles are very very harsh, very strong. So I, um, I knew that I wanted to explore lots of different styles of music on my violin, but for classical, the classical world, that was a bit naughty or um, something like that. So I had to really kind of find a way to still do classical, but also explore my um, interest and curiosity about improvisation. And that is when I found Astor Piazzolla. And I started playing a lot of his music, which is very technically challenging and as technically challenging and demanding um, as classical music, but also encompasses a lot of improvisation. So I got to kind of explore that and keep my classical colleagues happy. <laughs> um, and then probably, Another um, obstacle I still um, still uh, am confronted with a lot is the genre stereotyping. So as a violinist in a contemporary music world, there, there was not a lot of role models for me and not a lot of people who had done <clears throat> similar kind of things. So I would find that really challenging when I'd release music um, people wouldn't know how to categorise it. Um, and they still don't really. But I just kind of thought, well, maybe that's because what I'm doing is innovative and original and I'll just keep doing it because there wasn't really any other option. I love doing it that way. But 
um, it is a tricky thing, especially in this country, I think. Um, and then another obstacle, I guess, is I've seen over the last maybe 10 years a gradual um, devaluing of recorded music and music in general from um, general public, other musicians, um, seeing how streaming music has become very popular and back in the day I would sell CDs and it would mean that I could sustain my career financially um, performing original music but now with streaming it's very difficult so um, I think that there is like a educational thing that needs to happen for general public about how to ethically consume music. And I'm very passionate and interested in that. But I actually think that being a creative person, um, one of the ways to overcome those obstacles is to think differently about how I share music. Um, maybe people won't buy the recorded music, but maybe they want a different experience, an online experience or a live performance experience. And I just keep trying to think outside the box. Great strategy. <laughs> and do you have a motto or a personal philosophy that guides you? I mean, thinking outside the box is certainly one. Yeah. Um, or any particular advice you'd like to share with the younger musicians? Yeah, well, I think, um, yeah, thinking outside the box is definitely one that my mum actually taught me from a very young age. She's a visual artist, graphic designer, and she got me interested in lots of different styles of violin music and used to buy me these records um, of like Celtic Irish music and Ukrainian fiddle music. And um, so I think definitely um, because technology moves so quickly and things change a lot nowadays, I think you always have to be thinking outside the square. But one of the mottos that I've heard fairly recently in the last couple of years and I really love it is shun the non-believers um I think you just have to start with believing in yourself and the rest will kind of fall into place beautiful mm -hmm. right um and could you please nominate a song or an album of your creation that is particularly important to you or significant somehow and then just tell us a few things about it so when we're listening we have a bit of insider's knowledge. Sure. So I'm nominating my album called Three and it came out um, a couple of years ago now and it is a completely solo violin improvised album. So um, leading up to this point, I hadn't really put out many instrumental records but it was something that I would do live all the time either solo or in the twox or just any time um, and it's often the thing that I get called to do with collaborators and yet I never recorded it because I thought yeah yeah but I just find that really easy and that's that's like no one's going to want to listen to that just solo violin improvising um, but then like I realized that something that I really love listening to is improvised solo violin music. So I would often seek it out <laughs> and I thought maybe I should record one. Um, and this was around the time that I started uh, finding my voice as well. So that's only a couple of years ago. It's taken me a while and actually it's just meant going back to where I kind of was 10 years ago. Um, and Believe, like believing in myself and thinking that the music that I play is enough and it's something that I can offer. So I decided to do this solo record and I had booked in the date and I was like, booked in this date. Um, and then I started freaking out because I was like, I haven't written anything. What am I going to play? And then, um, in you know, it was probably a month before and I thought, actually, I'm not going to compose anything. I'm going to not prepare anything. I'm just going to go in and make it all up on the spot. And that made me feel so much more relaxed and really excited too. <laughs> so I went into the studio with Miles Mumford and set up all my amps and all my pedals and my loop station. And I even was like so confident that it was going to go well that I brought in a 
um, videographer. I was like, yep, let's bring it all in. Like, let's believe in this project. And so then I just over the course of about three hours just played. And um, when I listened back to it, everything, I put everything on except for maybe two tracks, the first one and the very last one. Um, the rest went on the album. And I had, yeah, created all these little pieces of music and didn't, we didn't edit anything. Like we just put some effect, extra effects on here and there and yeah, just completely instrumental. And it's an album that's very special to me because I just was my, completely myself. And so I had always had a dream to create a vinyl one day and I ended up putting that one on vinyl. So I'll never be able to afford vinyl ever again, but I decided for that one. <laughs> I'd pop it on vinyl. Fabulous. And what a brave, courageous thing to do. <laughs> That's really fantastic, really inspiring. Thanks. Yeah, it was, I feel like it's often my safer space. It's my happy space. So um, sometimes when I have to go in the studio and play something that's written or whatever, it's more scary for me than just getting to make it up. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Zanny, and for sharing, uh, you know, some of your story with us and really inspiring words and wishing you all the very best with everything. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea.